wanted to carry on from where I left off, but I'm not going to be talking much about quasar observations today, but I just wanted to tell you about two topics that we've been working on recently, one of which is actually recently published, so the, the experts in the audience will know about this, and one topic which is not um, published yet and which I'm, I'm kind of excited about because of the potential it has, and so I want to tell you about uh, that one first. If you can remember um, what I said in the first talk, I spent some time talking about high-resolution spectra of quasars, and I spent some time pointing out that the absorbing gas that we have to study at high redshift has quite a complex structure. Unfortunately, nature doesn't give us just one neat and tidy cloud sitting out in space with a nice line of sight right through the middle going to the background quasar. It gives us a whole complex of uh, cloudlets, if you like, with peculiar velocities with respect to each other, a complex structure in the absorbing gas. And that's hard to model. It's a time-consuming process and to do that manually. Uh, that's one of the difficulties. It's time-consuming. It takes, it takes people sitting at the computer for weeks, months on end. Uh, maybe the best way I can impress upon you how time-consuming it is, that with 2014, a shell spectrographs were first put on 8-metre class telescopes, I'm not sure, but at least 15 years ago, we only have, uh, in our sample, 300 measurements of the fine structure constant uh, over a redshift range of around about 0.2 out to about 4 and a bit. So those 300 measurements essentially took you know, the best part of a decade and a half, in, in a sense, and that's from my group and another group that has done work on this field, the, the, the nearest competitor, if you like, is, has got a sample of 23. So it is very difficult. Um, in a kind of related field that I mentioned in the first talk, measuring the uh, primordial deuterium abundance, there are 11 reasonable measurements in the literature at the moment. The topic uh, was invented, if you like, in the 1970s, and, and it was first possible to get data in the, uh, in the, in the mid-1990s. So it's a very, very time-consuming process, um, and it requires a reasonable amount of expertise, a, an enormous amount of care with the wavelength calibration, and even when you get to the end of it, because it's a human process, it's, it's a process in which there could be human bias. And so you really want to try and work out a smarter way of doing it. So I've been working with a PhD student for a while. He's just writing up right at the moment on uh, applying a, a genetic algorithm to the problem of analyzing quasar spectra. Uh, and it seems to work. I've, I've had many a go at this before starting to work with this one particular PhD student and um, uh, failed in all of my previous attempts. But uh, so I pass the credit for this to, to my PhD student who has done a really, really good job in putting it all together. And I'll show you some of the, some of the results from what we're doing. And it's, it's quite impressive. I showed you that slide before, but I just wanted to put that up again as a reminder of what the data looks like. And this is by no means the worst data that we, uh, we try and fit. This is a kind of, I suppose, fairly typical spectrum. It's a, an absorption system at a redshift of 2.6. It exhibits many different species. Some of them are shown here, but not all. Singly ionized iron, singly ionized silicon, uh, aluminium uh, three, doubly ionized aluminium, chromium and zinc lines, uh, and others. And as you can see, some of these lines are saturated. The intensity goes down to zero. In those particular lines, there's almost no information about the velocity structure in the gas. And remember from the first talk, we're trying to look at positions of, of lines. And so if the line is saturated, clearly you can't do that. So it's a simultaneous fit to all of that data um, at once, which gives you the information that's indicated in the blue ticks above the, each of the absorption lines. And you can see it's very complicated. The model that you get out in order to get the normalized residuals to be unity is quite complicated, and it is not unique. That's the second problem. I said it was very time consuming to do something like this. It also ends up with a model which is non-unique. And we'd really like to change that. I mean, we're talking about um, hundreds of night, nights on eight meter telescopes uh, that exist of data of this quality. So it's, it's a huge financial investment, and yet I don't, think, I don't really think that we've 
we've yet perfected the, the anal analysis methods. So we've put together, this is a bit of a complicated slide, I'm going to go through this quite slowly. We've put together what I think, I believe the statisticians would call a genetic algorithm, possibly actually, somebody in the audience may correct me, a mimetic algorithm, I think, because it's actually a combination of, uh, of a straightforward genetic code, but also local non-linear least squares optimization. So it's a kind of complicated process. Now, I'll, I'll run through this, because I think it's, it's interesting, it's very interesting how well it works. Um, you probably can't read what's inside the boxes on the flowchart, but I want to go through each step so that I, I, I hopefully can explain clearly how this works. On the right-hand panel, which I'm going to come back to and talk about, that's just one transition. One of those transitions that was in the previous uh, <coughs> slide, it's iron 2, 2382. Now, what we want to do here is remove human uh, involvement completely, essentially, so that instead of having a smart human doing this, we've got a dumb computer doing it. We go away and do something more interesting. Um, the first thing we've got to do, of course, at least the human does have to put together all the atomic data. We've got to, we've got to establish a database of the best atomic data. That's an input, a set of inputs to the, to the program. One thing that we haven't yet um, automated, although it is quite a tr relatively trivial thing, is, is to identify all the different species uh, in the gas cloud that is doing the absorption. So, uh, you know, you just look at a spectrum, and you've seen them, I've put them up now, it's just a, a complex pattern of absorption lines, but we have to know what each of those absorption lines is due to. Is it hydrogen, is it silicon, is it oxygen, or whatever. We have to make those identifications. That, that, that's, a, I think, a rather trivial thing to automate. We actually just haven't done that yet. I think we've cracked the hard problem first. We want to, of course, know very well all the instrumental parameters. The photons come from the object through a, a complex instrument onto CCD detectors. We need to know the performance characteristics very well of the instrument because the goal here is to take the data and fit a theoretical model to it, and one of the free parameters in that theoretical model being the fine structure constant. So we need to establish what those things are, but that's okay, we can, we can do that fairly well. We then need to define the segments of spectral data that we want to produce a model for. That's also a relatively trivial task. Um, and then we want to set up, essentially, not, the not in detail, but a guideline to the model that we want to, want to produce. What are we fitting? We're fitting iron 2, 2382, silicon 2, 1526, uh, zinc 2, chromium 2, etc. We need to, we need to establish what, what it is. That's really, I suppose, the same point as identification. Um, and then we want to, after that, initialize the process by having a first guess at the theoretical model. But that's the bit that we don't want the human to do because that's where the greatest degree of subjectivity um, gets in. So that first step, initialization set up. So the, the second step is, is reproduction. So we're going to then start using this Darwinian type of language, uh, the reproduction process. Now, um, looking at the top panel of the diagram on the right, uh, you can see the black curve is the real data. And uh, you can see a model that's been fitted to it that obviously doesn't work. It's the simplest possible model that we could have fitted. One single absorption cloud to, to that uh, model. Clearly it doesn't work. In the right-hand column on that diagram are the normalized residuals. The horizontal blue lines are the one sigma error contours, and of course with a model like that, the, uh, the, um, one sigma, the, uh, the uh, normalized residuals are way outside of the uh, one sigma lines. Okay, so we then we want to set up the, um, at each step as we move down that um, left-hand column of the figure on the right, we want to set up a parent which then um, acts as the input guess for the next step. So we're building the model up slowly. Um, we want to, in the same language, popul populate the M by N spectral segments. Now it's M by N, so it's a multidimensional problem because um, I'm only showing in the plot on the right one single transition, but there could be 10, 15, 20 
different transitions. Or in the case of some analyses, uh, for example, molecular hydrogen, uh, even hundreds. And each of those spectral segments will have uh, a you know, finite number of pixels in them. So it's a, there's a, quite a lot of data that goes into the fit. So at each iteration, moving down the left-hand uh, panel of the figure on the right, build up the model in an intelligent way so, so that we end up with something that's as good as a human can do at the end. And so very, it's very simple, actually. So we start off in the top panel with one, uh, with one single gas cloud fitted to the data. But you can, uh, you, you, can see that, you can see the green vertical tick in the top panel, the one marked number one, uh, and there's only one of them. But in fact, that's the best one. So in fact, there were a large number of trials uh, for different positions of the absorption line with a local nonlinear uh, minimization at each of those and then a statistical test to, um, to find out the best of that family. So you're seeing a, a tiny subset in the diagram on the right of, uh, of the whole process. Third step, mutation. Increase the model complexity, uh, adding additional uh, absorption components. Next step, fourth step in the blue ellipse, local nonlinear least squares optimization of all of the M by M models. Don't forget, there's a whole set of those that's being fitted simultaneously. Selection, then from the M by N, pick the fittest uh, lowest chi-squared model, and then finally evolution, check that the uh, the selected model uh, check the selected model against the stopping criteria. Now, so there's certainly some human input there. You've got to define the criteria that you use to uh, tell the computer when to stop when you've got an acceptable um, model at that generation, one to twenty. What you can see as it goes through, so you can see the normalized residuals. It's probably more interesting to look at the column on the right first. The normalized residuals uh, become as good as you need. They're, they're essentially, by the time you get down to generation 20, they're as good as a human could do. And it's a reproducible process because the parameters are all fixed. That doesn't mean to say that you end up with one model at the end, which is an unambiguous fit to the data. That's not the case. You actually end up with a distribution of models, which uh, give you a, an acceptable fit to the data. So rather than having one model and one standard deviation to describe your, your interesting parameter, uh, you've actually got a whole distribution of those quantities. So it's a, perhaps arguably more complicated to, I suppose, present results. But, but, but there's, a way, there's a way around that. So just before I move, move off, at, so you, you basically trial all positions at each step, local minimization each time, and gradually adding parameters as you move forward. Parameters can get excluded. So uh, the 1 to 20 isn't actually just the number of free parameters or proportional to the number of free parameters necessarily. Parameters can get thrown out by the, um, uh, by the non-linear least squares process and uh, so you can go from one step to the next with the same number of free parameters but that's out of out of the user's control at that point that's the process and it seems to work uh, really well as you can see from uh, panel 20 now it's interesting that a genetic algorithm doesn't necessarily emulate what a human does and here's one example of uh, the same data um, in the bottom panel, it was fitted by uh, a colleague. It wasn't somebody in our team. And you can see the green lines there, which show where all of the components were found to be positioned in order to obtain the model that you see. Uh, and I think that gives an indication, the bottom row of diagrams, as to how hard this is. Because if you look at the normalized residuals, they're reasonable, but they're not great. Whereas at the top, um, same transitions using this, this algorithm if you just line up with your eye where the green bars are, you can see that the structure is uh, quite different in some cases, and you can also see that the normalized residuals are, are very good. So this potentially is an enormous time saver and could speed the whole process up, but also make it um, far more objective than we've achieved so far. So when you Solve then for the fine structure constant. Now, rather than having a single value, you've got uh, a distribution of values for every generation. So for every position down that uh, 
panel on the right, uh, you have then a distribution of alphas. And uh, it, it kind of looks a little bit like that for that particular uh, system. Um, so vertical axis, fractional change in the fine structure constant in units of 10 to the minus 6, and then that generation number moving along the right. So moving from right on the left-hand side with a totally inadequate model with uh, a generation um, one, where the points are actually for generation one, only two of them have appeared within the, the scale plotted, but many of them were outside. Uh, and then as you move along, you can clearly see that they, they start to tighten up. And interestingly, once you get beyond, it for, in this case, generation 11, things tighten up. Where the heavy blue circles are, there are a lot of points sitting on top of each other. There's, a, there's some scatter, but there's, there's rather a large number of points sitting in the same place. And visually, you get the impression that the, the thing stable, uh, stabilizes as you get into the green region. I'll say more about the green region in a minute, but, I, but not yet. It, it's interesting that it looks like, with this procedure, that the solution for alpha is, is, is quite stable to the first guesses in the sense that once you get to some particular point, which is clearly quite close to where the normalized chi-squared has reached unity, not surprisingly, the value of alpha doesn't change. Now, that probably wouldn't have been obvious. I don't necessarily think I could have predicted that. I think I understand why in retrospect, but I would not necessarily have predicted it. The reason is just simply that as the procedure goes through, as it builds up, uh, it, it, it turns out that in a natural way, the, uh, each successive addition of a component to the model is less important in the determination of alpha. It gets the strong lines first, in other, way, in other words. Uh, and so it, it reaches a kind of nice stability. Now, we haven't analyzed yet uh, the, the entire database using this method because we're still, this is really uh, work that's not yet complete. But we have done a, a, um, a quite a few, a, you know, a few uh, 20 or so, something like that. And this, this seems to be a common characteristic that we meet this stability, which is rather comforting because it, it means that, uh, you know, actually, even if it was a human doing, it probably wouldn't matter too much if we get the right answer. So you end up, when you finish a calculation, with an enormous amount of data because you've got thousands and thousands of model fits to the data. And then the question is, what do you do with those? How do you pick the answer? What is the answer? It's not really anymore like sitting down you know, and fitting one model to a set of data. You've now got thousands of models to, uh, to pick from. How do you pick them? And so you have to do post-processing statistical tests. And so we did get just a little bit over-enthusiastic about this, actually. Uh, I mean, we started with the normalized chi-squared, just uh, check what the normalized chi-squared does at each step, and you saw the red curve in the first plot, and then we looked at maximum likelihood, but of course that's really just the same as chi-squared anyway, if the, if, the, if, the, if, the, uh, if the errors are well behaved, and then we looked at the F-test uh, to see whether we get a different solution to that, and then we looked at uh, the KK information criteria. Uh, some people like that a lot, but some people don't like it. And if you don't like that, you probably wouldn't like the AICC either, the corrected uh, AKK information test that penalizes in a different way for, for the number of free parameters that you put in iteratively as you build up your fit. Or you could go with the consistent AIC. We had a go at that one, had a look at that. And if, now, some people like Bayesian information statistics. Other people start to feel slightly nauseous when they hear about them, and uh, so well, we had a look at that one, and if you feel nauseous about the Bayesian information criteria, you're pro probably going to be running for the bathroom with the AKK Bayesian information criteria, and we had a look at that one just to see what we would get, and so on, focused information criteria, and we actually did really get a bit silly at this point, I think, uh, the Hanan Quinn information criterion. Minimum, it's all right, it's coming to an end, minimum description length, and uh, HBF, I can't even remember what that one is. Uh, focused information, anyway, etc. Right, so we did actually look at all of those statistics, but the there's a kind of, there is a serious point in there. The, the, um, the error arrays in the data that we're dealing with aren't necessarily well behaved. They are not independent, um, the data points that we have are not independent data points. The spectra have been through a considerable amount of processing, rebinning, calibration. They're not simple photons in, in buckets. Uh, and so you really do want to 
um, explore different, t different statistical tests. Uh, but I don't think you need to have gone this far, but I just put it in for fun. But anyway, we actually took it further and quantified the whole thing. Uh, there's a table with a whole lot of information in it. Now, on the left-hand side, you can see the generation number. It goes from 1 to 30 here. Uh, basically, didn't change much after 20, so we didn't plot that for the, for the plots that I've showed. Uh, chi-squared, I don't know if you can read the figures actually, but you can see it stabilize very nicely once you get to about um, uh, uh, generation 11. Norm, uh, uh, chi-squared, the number of free parameters you can see build up from each, um, each generation. Um, 4, 7, 10, 13, 16, 19, 22, uh, 25, 20. So actually there are some jumps when it wasn't necessarily just adding in one extra set of three parameters. Uh, and so on. And then the rest of it are actually, those are all the statistical tests. Now, you can take a diagram like that and then define um, essentially an interesting region, if you like, for the set of data that you've got. Uh, and so that uh, rather nauseous looking colour chart attempts to do that in some way. But rather than go into the details of that, we, we essentially just wanted to try and establish a range in generation that would give us what we might regard as an acceptable set of models. That then gives us a distribution uh, of results. Now, that's, that's, that's where we got to on, uh, on that subject. We've, we haven't applied this to the entire database, but that's our next step. And it, it, it does seem to work, and so we will, uh, we will be able to just emulate everything that we've done with the, the Quasar data um, and uh, see whether we get the same, which I suspect that we will. At least now, it, it won't take several years to do that. To run that software on the entire sample is, uh, is a few days processing, uh, with nobody attending it, essentially. I want to move on to a separate topic. I just wanted to introduce that as, a, as an idea, because, it, because uh, clearly finding a, a dipole in alpha is... Um, a controversial thing and we've been trying quite hard for uh, to make it go away essentially and so this is part of that that's part of that attempt something else that we've done recently changing topic for the, the second part of the talk is to look at ask the question uh, at John Barrow's suggestion actually as to whether alpha could be varying with gravitational potential uh, and one interesting place that that can be looked at is in the photosphere of a white dwarf. So there's one particular star that's been studied for this, G191b2b. Three of the, including me, three of the, the co-authors co -authors of this paper here. Just a quick reminder for those who would like it as to what a white dwarf is. Um, it's a white dwarf is just a star in the final stages of its evolution in the mass range 0.07 to 1.4 solar masses, supported by electron degeneracy. Uh, it, these things are quite well understood. We know where they sit on the uh, Hertzsprung-Russell Hertzsprung diagram. It's a stable phase, phase in a, a star's lifetime. If the star, if the star mass is less than 1.4 solar masses, there are plenty of these objects, therefore, around for us to study. Their low uh, luminosity, mass close to the, the sun, and yet they're very small, the radius is only about that of the Earth, so they're very, very compact, very dense objects, um, average density up to about a million times that of water. They can only be, because they're fairly low luminosity, they can only be observed uh, when they are relatively near to Earth, but um, they are still a lot brighter than quasars, and so uh, we can get extremely good quality data from these things in principle. This one particular spectrum that we've looked at is indeed very high quality indeed. So we're asking the question, does alpha depend on gravitational potential? This is data that came from the Hubble Space Telescope. It, goes, it makes use of the many multiplet method that I described in the first talk. Um, and, uh, and so that little, those two little um, panels at the bottom just remind you that if there's a change uh, in alpha, um, then 
you would get a shift in some lines but not others. The anchor lines would not move and the more sensitive lines would move. That's a picture of the actual raw spectrum. All of those very narrow downward pointing things are actually absorption lines. You can see the noise in the spectrum, the thick black band. Uh, and there are hundreds of lines in this spectrum. And um, Simon Preval is sitting there, did the painstaking task of identifying all of these lines. And uh, there are um, several hundred iron five and nickel five lines, and uh, each of which has been measured uh, and uh, identified. So the orbital properties, the complete atomic details of each transition are known, and therefore for each of those lines one can calculate the sensitivity to a change in alpha. There's just a zoom in on some of these lines. They're, they're very narrow, they're clean compared to the quasar data, uh, and so one can use relatively simple methods, at least as a first look, which is what we've done, to measure their positions, catalogue those positions, and then compare the positions using the many multiplet method with um, laboratory values. It's at 45 parsecs from us. Those are the parameters for the star, 0.51 solar masses, the radius 0 0.022 solar radii. The gravitational potential, gm over rc squared, is about 10 to the 5 times larger than in our laboratories on Earth. So we are probing uh, a different physical regime. The data was collected using the STIS spectrograph on the Hubble Space Telescope, which has a resolution well, for these data, for the setup that was used, of 144 thousand, so lambda over delta lambda, 144,000 for the quasar spectra, it's, uh, it's more like a third of that. So the spectral resolution here is three times as good, roughly speaking, as the quasar data. The laboratory wavelengths have been measured a long time ago, the, the measuring accurate sets of uh, iron and uh, nickel lines back in, I think, the 70s, uh, and not been repeated since, but nevertheless are quite um, precise. The fact that we've got hundreds of lines is very helpful in some ways to deal with systematics for the reasons that I said in the first talk. We've got higher ionization lines, so there's iron 5, nickel 5, and that tends to mean that the sensitivity coefficients are higher than they were for the quasar data. Now, just let me run through how it's done. So we're defined, first of all, delta alpha over alpha as alpha um, at the distance of the star minus alpha on, on Earth divided by alpha on Earth. And that's then equal to some coefficient, which depends upon alpha, times delta phi, uh, where <coughs> delta phi is delta gm over rc, RC squared. If that the observed wavelength is lambda, the laboratory wavelength is lambda naught, and so a fractional change in the wavelength that we see comparing a wavelength seen in the star to the same transition observed in the laboratory, delta lambda divided by lambda naught, it's just lambda minus lambda naught over lambda naught, that's then uh, is equal to uh, z minus q alpha, big Q alpha, delta alpha over one delta alpha over alpha times 1 plus z. Now, the z's are just measuring the peculiar velocity uh, of the star with respect to us, and that's an uninteresting parameter which you can solve for uh, and, and hence remove. So, so the, the only parameters that were actually left uh, here of, of interest are the, the remaining ones. The z's essentially we can just fit out. So big Q, um, uh, big Q there, it's at the bottom of the page there, probably should have been at the bottom of the other page, sorry about that. Big Q is uh, 2 little q divided by omega naught. Omega naught is the laboratory uh, frequency, and so that relationship there gives you the sensitivity of a transition of a particular omega naught to uh, a change in the value of alpha. You can parameterize the sensitivity of each transition as put in the first equation, little q is d omega over dx, um, where we are talking about very small changes in alpha, 
and the x in this case is just equal to alpha of alpha naught squared minus 1, which for small alpha then is approximately 2 delta alpha over alpha. Now, the star's got a, um, the lines will be shifted with respect to the laboratory wavelengths. And, uh, well, what shifts them? There are three things which shift the lines. One is just the straightforward Doppler motion of the star. Um, that's fine. We can just solve for that. That's uninteresting. The second one is a gravitational redshift, um, which is also fine because basically that's just another contribution to uh, a, a shift common to every line. The third thing, though, is the third thing that would shift the lines is any possible dependence of, um, uh, of the line position on alpha, or in other words, any, any dependence of alpha on the uh, gravitational potential. So we can parameterize um, that uh, shift as 1 plus z is equal to omega naught, the laboratory frequency, um, z redshift, omega naught plus qx divided by omega. Uh, and q, of course, the things that we have to calculate uh, to, to do this. Finally, then, if we just want to relate the laboratory wavelength to the observed wavelength in the photosphere, then it's just delta lambda over lambda naught is lambda minus lambda naught over lambda naught equals uh, z uh, minus, well, I went through that one already. Okay, so what, what you can do then is, is plot delta lambda over lambda against q alpha because the slope of that, as you can see from the last but one formula on the page, will give you a delta alpha over alpha. So that's... It's, so it's a simple measurement to make. Uh, no need for the complex modeling that we have with the quasar data so, data, so it's rather nice in that respect. Unfortunately, you get something that looks like that. It doesn't make any sense at all uh, when you do this with this spectrum, and this is the only spectrum it's been done with. So you get for the, the iron 5 points, and there are far more of them, as you can see, one slope, and for the... Um, red points, which are the nickel 5 values, a different slope. Uh, it may look like the line doesn't fit the data very well, but if you look carefully, you can see there's a kind of dip uh, to Q of about 0.08 to 0.09, and that brings the line down a little bit. But, um, but the two don't seem to be very consistent. If you actually just, with the raw data, they present alpha, you get 4.2 plus minus 1.6, units of 10 to the minus 5 from the iron 5 lines and minus 6.1 plus minus 5.8. So opposite sign for the uh, nickel 5 line. So that's rather disappointing. It doesn't make much sense. There is obviously something wrong um, <coughs> because you would expect all those points to sit on top of each other and, and, uh, and have zero slope if alpha was the same as on Earth. Uh, or if alpha was different, you would at least expect the data points to sit on top of each other, whatever they were going to do. Um, <coughs> so where's the mistake? Um, now, when we wrote this up, we actually said we thought the laboratory wavelengths were wrong. Um, and I, uh, I, I actually changed my mind. I don't think this is the explanation at all. Um, this just seemed to be a kind of easy explanation to begin with, um, but I think it's, it's a little bit more interesting and probably a bit more challenging than that. If you actually fit, look at the residuals about the best fit straight line, uh, averaged over both slopes, you get something like 0 0.03 milliangstroms, and the formal error bars quoted in the, um, in the uh, laboratory wavelength tables that are in the literature is 0 0.04 milliangstroms. So the scatter that you see at least about a best fit is very slightly smaller than, than what you would have expected on the basis of the, the published uncertainties. That kind of suggests that, that maybe the laboratory wavelengths are OK. Uh, it doesn't say that conclusively. I think it probably just hints at it. But the other way that one could get a result like that, which it really is peculiar, is, is to have uh, a non-linear wavelength distortion in the spectrum. Now, enormous care is put into calibrating these data. I'll, I'll talk about how it's done in just a second. And so this is quite a surprise if that's the case. Nevertheless, if you had a non-linear uh, wavelength distortion, 
incorrect mapping between the real and the observed wavelengths, then, um, then that, that would certainly mess things up. But um, for these data, we don't have any clear independent means of checking that. But there is a clue as to what the explanation is, and it's in this plot. So in this plot, uh, this is delta alpha over alpha against, al uh, against lambda naught, the, the, the rest frame wavelength. And, um, <clears throat> well, you can see that the first noticeable thing is that, of course, the wavelength, the distribution in wavelength of the two species is quite different. The nickel-5 sits at the blue end of the spectrum and the iron-5 sits predominantly at the red end of the spectrum. And the fact that for a plot of delta lambda over lambda against lambda naught gives us those two different slopes hints rather strongly that, in fact, we do have, a, in this data that we've measured, uh, a kind of uh, uh, non-linear um, mapping between the observed and the, um, and the laboratory wavelengths. Perhaps something like a, you know, like a, a, a double, a straight line with a break in it would, would, would fit this, um, a change in the slope at about 1,350 angstroms. In the paper that we actually published, then what we decided to do because of that was, was in fact assume that that was the case and remove that from the data. Simply use that to remove the, uh, this effect and then go back and reanalyze for alpha. But in retrospect, I don't think that probably makes a great deal of sense because if there was a signal there in the first place, um, you'd be throwing it out. So it's, it, it, it's not the right way to do it. Um, and so I think, you know, what we have to do instead is to work harder at the wavelength calibration. So, uh, and, but I think that there are possibilities here. So, you know, it sounds, it sounds a little bit depressing uh, that this is just too hard to do anything. But I don't think it's like that. I think, there's a, I think there's a way out. When you calibrate data like this, you typically, at least uh, for ground-based a shell spectroscopy. These are a shell spectrographs where the different spectral orders are broken up uh, to stack above each other on a, on a two-dimensional detector like that. So that's a kind of uh, a plot of a, two of a raw thorium argon uh, exposure, which then when you map it into a one-dimensional plot looks something like that, laden with uh, narrow, very well-measured wavelengths, which you can use to calibrate your data, provided you actually observe the lamp at the same time or a similar time to the observations were taken, which unfortunately for some of the ground-based data isn't actually the case because the engineers who build these instruments are so confident in their superb accuracy that they tell the observers it's simply not necessary incorrectly. Uh, but that's, I guess, life. Um, we do know there are calibration issues with the data. Uh, and I just wanted to um, mention, I put, I put this in the first talk, that first one there, if you have a slit of your spectrograph and, and, the, and in the first case on the left it's got good next to it, you've got a, a seeing disc uh, which is larger than the slit width then you're more or less uniformly filling the slit of the spectrograph with light, that's good and you will have a rather stable spectrum that comes out of it. On the other hand, uh, obviously talking about ground-based observations rather than space-based observations, if you're seeing becomes phenomenally good, which everyone loves because the photons get more focused. Uh, uh, it's good, but on the other hand, if your seeing disk becomes smaller than the slit width, then you're not uniformly filling the slit and you're very sensitive then to slight um, shifts in the telescope or with the object with respect to the slit, uh, and that would cause shifts in the spectrum. It wouldn't cause necessarily a lot, it shouldn't cause uh, a nonlinear um, distortion. It would just uh, cause a shift. The, the, third, the third case, that is bad if you've got a fairly uh, small seeing profile and it's uh, shifted with respect to the slit, then you will get a shift. But nevertheless, none of those things are going to give you the sort of effect that we've seen. That can't do it. That's just going to give us a simple shift. Um, in 2010, there was a paper published by Greek, Kim Greeston collaborators where they measured using the shell spectrograph on the Keck telescope, something that hadn't been seen, I think, before. Uh, which were intrapixel fluctuations. This is a, the, the bottom left diagram is a velocity shift between observed wavelengths and independently calibrated wavelengths as a function of 
uh, observed wavelength along the bottom, and you can see that the, the data there go up and down wildly in a rather consistent looking pattern with an amplitude of about 500 meters per second. That's quite large. Um, a shift of about that amount corresponds to, uh, would be caused by a, an alpha change of around about 1 times 10 to the minus 5. And, you know, we're, we are trying to make measurements at least a factor of an order of magnitude better than that. So this looks kind of catastrophic, and when they wrote their paper, they said that this, they said that this spoils the uh, capacity of a shell spectrographs to be able to make measurements of, of varying at alpha at a precision of greater than that. It's actually uh, true, but only for an individual measurement. Your transitions will fall with somewhere with respect uh, to those um, ups and downs in the distortion map, and so for a given individual measurement, you will have an additional systematic, which is a significant one. However, for a sample of uh, objects at different redshifts, so all the transitions fall at random positions along a, a plot like that, then uh, sure, you've just got, you've got extra errors, but they're random errors, no longer systematic errors. And so there's no way that something like that can cause can emulate a spatial variation of the fine structure constant. So that's all right. But there is a, a rather worse one. The third one is this. Uh, <coughs> uh, now, um, this is a really interesting little experiment. I think, to my knowledge, Paolo Malaro, who's sitting over there, was the first person to try this, and then it's been re reproduced. I, I uh, meant to put the, uh, the reference up there, but forgot, by Romani and others uh, and colleagues. What they did is, I think inspired by Paolo's first measurement, is to go away and observe asteroids. So uh, the asteroid, the idea is simply that the asteroid reflects the solar spectrum very nicely back into the telescope. The orbital characteristics of the asteroids are very, if you pick them carefully, very well known. Uh, and so you, could, you can, at any time, know their radial velocity down to something like, I think, a meter per second, which is very small in the scheme of this type of observation. Uh, and so then by um, observing um, the asteroid spectrum, breaking it up into little segments, cross-correlating each segment with an independently calibrated solar spectrum and working out a shift and then plotting the shift against uh, observed wavelength, you get these diagrams in the panel there for the five, for five different asteroids. And the bad news is that um, you do indeed see uh, shifts or, or trends in a diagram like that. And that's really not very nice because uh, that, the, the plot here is over about 400 um, angstroms. And uh, you know, these are fairly significant effects. So this is not nice at all. And the bad news from the point of view of quasar spectroscopy is that nobody observed asteroids at the same time that they were observing the uh, quasars. And so it's simply impossible to go back to the quasar data and make corrections uh, like this because, unfortunately, they seem to be time dependent. So that's quite nasty. Um, one, one can, of course, take a worst case scenario uh, and go back and refit all the quasar data and see what the impact is, and we're actually just doing that. So this is, uh, this is rather unfortunate, but all is not lost, because it's not realistic, probably, to repeat, to go back and ask the eight-metre time assignment committees to just simply go away and redo all the quasar observation, either taking asteroid observations or using some other calibration method, which you can be sure is going to get rid of these long uh, scale, large scale, uh, distortions, but nevertheless, you can uh, you can hopefully convince the um, powers that be who will be taking the data on the uh, large tele larger telescopes when they come along that, that that really this has to be looked at. But in the meantime, we can certainly, uh, in principle, go back and uh, reobserve something like this uh, white dwarf G191, um, but with uh, asteroid observations, for example, and. Uh, uh, and, and just see what happens to that strange uh, set of points for the iron five and the nickel five lines. And we were uh, 
Simon and I were just talking about that uh, yesterday and putting in a Hubble Space, probably we'll put in a Hubble Space Telescope to request to do that. So I think that would be a very interesting experiment, probably make about an order of magnitude difference to the constraints on delta alpha, alpha over alpha as a function of gravitational potential that I, that I put up. That's all I wanted to say scientifically. I just wanted to end up with something which is more of an entertainment um, uh, piece. Um, I came across this, and I don't know, we're all here because we're fascinated with varying constants, either from the philosophical or the physical point of view. Uh, and I happen to stumble across, if you've never seen this, I think you're going to like it. And if you have seen it, you'll probably like it. You'll probably still enjoy hearing it again. It's written in um, 1964 by Fred Hoyle. There was a whole edition of The New Scientist was devoted to 1984, you know, the 20 years beforehand. And Fred Hoyle decided to write quite a bit about varying constants, believe it or not, in 1984. Uh, a new physics out of astronomy. And he says this, I want to read this out to you because I think it's lovely. Um, he says, uh, so I haven't started at the beginning, even though there's quite a bit here. Turning now to the relation of astronomy to physics, in recent decades, physicists have tended to view astronomy in a rather unfavorable light. Astronomers are thought of as queer people, sleeping all day, living on mountains, <coughs> given to wild assertion and never concerned with anything fundamental insofar as it derives from a respectable source, I note he doesn't name the respectable source, this view is based, I think, on the following argument. Physics is concerned with particles and with their interactions. All interactions are local and can be discovered by local experiment. Hence, all physical laws can be discovered without stirring outside the laboratory. So astronomy can have nothing fundamental to offer. For myself, I do not concede this argument. What can one hope to discover by local experiment except local couplings between particles? Long-range couplings such as those envisaged in which local forces might be determined by the nature of the universe as a whole would stay untested, since we cannot shift the whole universe around in our experiments. If both local and long-range couplings exist and the latter are undiscovered, fundamental physics will remain a hodgepodge of elegance and ugliness as full of prescriptions as a chemist shop exactly as it looks today. And physics is indeed appallingly ugly with the strange numerical values it finds for its various coupling constants and other quantities. My suspicion is that important long range couplings do exist and that many of the quantities we normally think of as constants are subject to a slow variation with time. By a slow variation, I mean slow compared to the rate at which existing galaxies are moving apart. On this basis, the precise values of some of the key constants of physics would have no absolute significance. They would simply belong to the epoch at which we happen to live. Finally then, my long-range prediction is that astronomy will someday introduce a major revolution into physics. It may have happened by 1984, sadly not, nor perhaps quite by, by 2014, but maybe, you know, maybe we're closing in on it. I hope you enjoyed that. I, I love that piece of writing. Thank you. I'll stop there.